Hello, everybody. Welcome to my talk about Flask for fun and profit. Uh, my name is Armin Ronacher. I wrote this framework a couple of years ago, and I still maintain it. And this is going to be a talk that's mostly about what you can do with it, and why it works, why it doesn't work, how to combine it with other tools. Um, I live in Vienna, Austria. This is kind of far away. And I do open source things, mostly Flask framework and other stuff. So this is the library that I wrote, which most people know, which has became shockingly popular. Um, but I also spend a lot of time working on Sentry now, which is also an open source project, um, but it actually has a functioning business behind it. It's much easier to monetize applications. Uh, it's, it's kind of impossible to monetize, uh, I would say, libraries. Um, it's unusual for me to make a presentation about Flask. Usually I do presentations about just software development in general. Um, so I actually wasn't quite sure what content to put in there. Um, so I have a little bit of a section about why it exists, where it came from. And then the rest of it is sort of best ideas of how I have for using it. Um, so where it comes from is actually a couple of tools that existed before it. Um, so before I wrote Flask, which is sort of the stuff most people use, I wrote a library called Werkzeug, which is terribly named, um, which is an implementation of WSGI for the part of the application which sits as close as possible to the application, as opposed to the part which is a whiskey server or a transport to some other thing. Uh, whiskey or WSGI is a standard which the Python community came up with in 2004, so it's quite old at this point. And it's largely based on CGI, and it still underpins a lot of the web development that happens in Python. Uh, Werkzeug was not my first attempt to implement this. The first one was called, thing called, oh, well, not the first one. There was one before that I wrote, which called Whiskey Tools, which nobody used. And then before that, there was one called Collaborate, which even less people used. Um, and all of that came because I did a lot of PHP code for a German Ubuntu community. Uh, we had uh, installation of PHP VB, which is what everybody used back then to, write com uh, to run communities. And we discovered that PHP VB was not particularly well written at that point in time, and we wanted to write a new one. And we wanted to call it Puku, which is kind of why this still exists in the domain name. It says flask.puku.org. It's because we wanted to write a replacement for PHP VB in Python. So that's where it started. Um, and the inspiration for writing this thing uh, in Python was there was, at the time, a very popular development tool called Track. And Track actually had a very nice internal design, particularly in regards to how it dealt with plugins. And one of the things that Track had is it wrote all of its um, low-level code for dealing with uh, Apache um, or any web server itself. So it had its own fast CGI driver. It had its own CGI implementation. It had its own driver for Mod Python, if people still remember what this was. So it, that didn't used to be a standard of talking between application and server. Um, so when we wanted to, and we in this case is me and a friend of mine called Georg Brandl, who wrote this Sphinx documentation tool, we actually started to have to write this, this base transport layer. Um, that was a long time ago. And the idea was that we are going to write this base transport layer so that other people can then build PHP BBs and, and other software on top of it. So the, it was never really uh, the idea to write a framework like Django, which has this huge uh, like opinionated configuration system and so forth. It was just make the bare minimum so that it, it's easier to write up distrib distributable applications. So that's the origin story of this. And eventually, Flask was like the, the last sort of result that came out of this, uh, wanting to write uh, a base tool for people to use. Um, I tried to figure out why people like Flask. It actually is not that easy. It turns out that it's really, really popular. Uh, scarily popular. It, at this point, it has more stars on GitHub than Django, which is, I'm not sure why. Um, it's a tiny thing, I guess it's easy to pick up. Um, but it doesn't really move all that much compared to Django. Like, there's always more stuff you can put into Django. There's very little stuff you can put into Flask. Uh, because it has like a fixed box, and it doesn't want to make the box any larger. Um, but I think the API works with people well enough that it also seems to get popular uh, outside of the Python Flask ecosystem. So for instance, I noticed that Amazon released a new thing written in Python for their Lambda system. It's like serverless applications, which is weird because there is a server behind it. 
Um, but it's, uh, it's basically the API is, is, is very similar to Flask. And there are versions of this for Rust now I've seen. Um, overall, it has a very small footprint. So it's very easy for people to get, I guess, a good overview of what the overall API is, and also then to figure out how to dig down and find the internals. Um, so I think the parts where it's good at is you can make a very simple HTML heavy, like, um, uh, like just data insert uh, and update things, like whatever else falls into this category, be it a wiki or a, co a community forum or just simple website where you have like a content management system. All that sort of stuff which renders HTML directly, it's, it's quite good at, and JSON APIs. Um, so it's, it's just a, a reasonable default tool to build microservices or, or small applications. And it's smaller footprint, which means it's quite fast in reloading things. And I also think the testing is good, but again, I'm biased about this. There's one area where I know it's not particularly good at, where I would say it's actually really bad at, which is high performance asynchronous I.O. It's based on WSGI. That standard is totally not suitable for, um, for like concurrent I.O. things. Uh, so that's the part where you can't really use it. Um, there are some clones for it, for Twisted I've seen, and some other things. Um, but so I draw a clear line between normal application code and then um, high, high performance or highly concurrent asynchronous stuff, where I think the Flask ecosystem really doesn't work well in itself. Um, but I will cover later on kind of how you can deal with this um, and what happens if you need to combine uh, a, a traditional Flask application with something that is uh, like web sockets and things of that sort. OK, so this is kind of the first part about how I structure Flask applications or how I also see the Flask community structuring Flask applications, um, which is this pattern. So instead of making the application once somewhere, you make a function and the function creates the application. Um, that has a bunch of really neat benefits. The biggest one is that you can create multiple of those things at the same time, which most applications don't need to do, except when they run unit tests. Um, so this helps really well that an application might want to do different things depending on how the configuration is. By moving the creation of the, function, uh, the, of the application into a function, it gives you the opportunity to reconfigure the application in a really clean way. Um, so if you have used Django, Django has this huge uh, Django config settings thing. Um, it's a module, a global module, there are variables in there, and then other code might draw conclusions of the settings of those variables when it was first imported. That's a problem because if you want to flip this variable later on during testing, it might not have the effect that you expect it to do. So very often people have to do like monkey patching or restructure code so that it looks at the configuration variable at a later point. Also means that you can't test concurrently because you expect that the framework actually stays in this configuration for the duration of that individual test. Um, so by moving it into functions, um, you can have two applications live at the same time with slightly different configuration and then uh, run the tests at the same time or, or just make sure that the tests are properly isolated. Um, one of the effects of this is that the application object is in a function, so it's kind of hard to see elsewhere. Um, the way you can deal with this quite easily is there's a function called here register blueprints. Um, this is not a function that exists, but basically the idea is that you, you move all of your application code into what's called the blueprint in Flask, which moves basically all the operations that would be performed on application objects on a dummy object, and the dummy object later goes in and registers itself with the application. So in this case, um, this is sort of what, the find, what you would find in most applications I write. There's a utility in Werkzeug called find modules, and import string. And they walk um, basically every module under a certain path. So in this case, it goes in and finds all the modules under my app.blueprints. And then you can import this. And then if there is an attribute called blueprint on it, then it registers this blueprint with the application. So that's a straightforward way to, to move code out into uh, a common structure. The, uh, the other pattern that uh, makes this create app interesting for some use cases, uh, it's not as common, I would say, but it's very useful, is that you wrap the entire Flask application in another object, um, which you can call whatever you want. 
and it just forwards the whiskey call into the application. The reason for that is that on the Flask application object, you have a, a huge number of objects and uh, attributes and methods and everything else. So if you plan on storing a lot of your own stuff on it, you're running at risk of overlo uh, overloading um, sort of a shared namespace that you have with Flask itself. Um, so this, for instance, I've seen when people write applications which are very highly specific and expose an API that other people want to use. So for instance, um, if you have microservices, and this microservice has a lot of microservice specific configuration that is not has nothing to do with Flask. So for instance, it wants to talk to uh, a broker, a Redis broker, or like AMQP broker, and it has a uh, very specific configuration which, is, um, which lives outside of the Flask ecosystem, but it's something that they might use in a different part of the system which is written in Flask, uh, in Django. Then it makes sense to move this entire configuration to a common object, and they can do this with this. Um, in that case, it sets a reference to the to this my thing onto the Flask app so that from any other place where you have a Flask app, you can rediscover this outside type. Um, that's something that's useful uh, in some situations, but it's not something that always comes up. Now, once you move an application into um, once you move an application into a function, the question is how do you actually configure it? Uh, because now it's you need to call this function somehow. So as of the last Flask release or the one before, the best way to do that is to have a second file for a development called devapp.py. It imports this create app function. It configures it for local development, and it just assigns it to this app variable. And then afterwards, what you can do is you can just export Flask underscore app in your shell to point to this file. You export Flask debug equals one. And then if you run Flask run, uh, it discovers this file, and it will use this file as the source of reference to create the application. Um, the Flask tutorial will actually point you to running app.run on it. Um, there was a recent change with it. And the reason for this is that there were two very annoying cases that people were used to run into a lot when they did create Flask application at the end of the module run app.run. The first one is that when a syntax error happens, the reloader will import the syntax error, and it will die. And the reason it will die is because uh, it, it can't run this module again, and the, the reloader is, is kind of restricted in regards to how it can deal with this. Uh, it doesn't have much choice other than dying. Um, this fixes this, because the app Flask run thing is in isolation, so it can, it can, keep your, it can import your code. Um, and if your code happens to have a syntax error, it will still manage to run itself. Uh, without dying. The other one is that if you actually consider flask.run is the last thing that runs in your, in your module, which means all the things that run up to the point of flask.run have to be executed before the reloader can kick in. And the way the reloader actually worked is that it ran all the way up down to app.run, and then it reloads once and runs through this whole thing, whole thing again. So a bunch of people ran into this issue where they're not really exposed that this is what the reloader is doing and has to do conceptually. Um, that they run setup code twice. So for instance, uh, they would create a database twice, or they would uh, try to create a temporary file and append to it, and then everything would execute twice. Um, this fixes this, because flask.run is a shell command that comes now with Flask. It will spawn a server, and then it will, on first request or in the background, will load your application, will configure it, and then will serve it up to you. And what's even nicer about this now is that the reloading happens without ever dropping a connection. So before that, it used to be the case that when it reloads, you got a connection reset every once in a while because the application was not back. Now it will nicely wait for you until the application has finished reloading um, and you don't lose any HTTP requests, which helps local development a lot. Um, the last thing some people don't know is that latest Flask versions actually have a pin for the debugger. So it used to be the case that you can just run local code in your debug pages, and it will execute just fine, until um, there was an incident where quite a popular website had a debug version of their application running in an EC2 cluster on a 
staging environment, I think. I, I'm not going to name the company, but it was large enough that I figured that that's going to make really bad publicity because their entire user database got hacked because on their staging environment, someone figured out that the Flask debugger was running and was just executing uh, Python code and then basically downloading the entire idea of their MySQL database into the world. Um, that's why there's a pin now, because the pin is printed on the shell, so you need to have shell access to see the pin so that you can enter it once. And even with the pin, don't run the debugger in production, or don't deploy the debugger anywhere where people can run it it's, uh, or can access it. Terrible idea. Yeah, so basically this is the improved debugger. Instead of running app.run debug true, do this. Uh, it's going to be a much nicer development experience, even though the old one still works. Um, this is something that got very heatedly debated a couple of years ago, and I think it's still something that people have very strong opinions about, um, which is this, the fact that Flask has a current app request object and the G object, and they are always there. Uh, you don't have to pass them from function to function like you do in Django. They're just there. Um, how many people here hate this? <laughs> I'm assuming there must be multiple. So there's at least one person. The other ones are too sh There's another one. So this is, this is something that um, I know there were very, very strong fights about this in one way or the other. Is it a good idea to always have these global variables there with this patch? Um, I used to hate this. I went out of my way to avoid this entirely. Um, there, there was a framework before called uh, Turbo Gears. Turbo Gears had the same thing. I absolutely hated Turbo Gears, and I, I even wrote a blog post about how terrible it is that they have global variables which give you access to the request object. The problem is that the longer you do this, eventually you kind of realize that even if you try to not have those things, they still have to be global variables somewhere, hidden away. So for instance, in Django, getting access to the, um, if you use Django, there's a function called getText, it exists in many different systems. It will give you a translation. How does the function know which language to translate to? Well, they happen to have somewhere hidden away a thread local variable, which is exactly what this is with the current language. So they have the same problem. The, 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 the transaction system and database connection pooling system in Django also has a reference back to the request object to figure out what it has to like. Uh, keep as a current database connection, current transaction. So since they already have that problem, um, I decided with Flask that we're going to just embrace the hell out of it, and we're going to make it a public API. Everybody can see how this is, works under the, under the hood. The way it works in Flask is once you have an application object, it could be in a function, for instance, when you call with app.app context, it puts a reference to the current application on a thread local variable somewhere. And from that moment on, all of those proxies refer back to the application. So if, for as long as you're in that block and in the current thread, current app refers back to this app object. Um, that's how it works. There are two contexts. One of them is the app context, uh, which is the one that most people don't know about. The second one is the request object, uh, the request context. Um, so there are four global variables. One of them is called request and flask.session. Both of them refer to the current HTTP request. And then there is flask.g and flask.current app, which refer back by an indirection to the current app context. Um, what's important to know is that even though it's called app context, it only lives for the current request. So if you put something on flask.g and the request goes away, at the end of the request, it will be torn down the same way as the request goes away. Uh, so when you create uh, a request context, which happens automatically when an HTTP request goes in, it automatically also creates an app context. Why is that relevant? Why is it interesting? Um, it's interesting because you have a bunch of information which is relevant for what I would call the current execution. Um, so that could be the current request, it could be the current cron shop, it could be the current whatever type of execution you have which has a clear starting and end point. So for instance, cron shops, uh, often, when you have them, they need to reference some data. Uh, so for instance, very often, if you have, um, if you have uh, something to do, there will be a security context, like what, what is allowed to be done by code under the current circumstances? What language is this thing supposed to be in? Like if you have an internationalized website, you will have loads and loads of functions which will execute at arbitrary points in time, 
which will need to give you a string translated to a very specific language, which happens to be the language of the current user, of the current cookie, whatever it is. So this data is context data. It needs to live somewhere. In Flask, you can always put it on the G object. And then whatever code executes afterwards will be able to refer back to the current language. Um, by putting it on this app context, we put it on a place which is really cheap to create. Creating an app, an app context doesn't take a lot of effort. Creating an entire request object, function tests and stuff like this, is a lot more work because it needs to set up all of this HTTP stuff. So the idea is that with the app context, it's very cheap to create. You get the G object, you get the current app, you can store all this information on there, like database connections, um, like translations, and so forth. Um, and, and it's very easy to understand for a test as well. Like when will it start living? When will it stop existing? Um, so if you have run a crunch up, for instance, you could set up the app context, and then all your database connection stuff will continue functioning until the app context tears down, and then the connection gets closed. Usually, it also means the transaction gets committed. So how does this work? So you can do resource management like this. This is actually from the documentation. You, you can structure it like this, where you have a function called getDatabase. Um, and you can do this for whatever kind of resource you have, which, have, uh, which you need to manage. First, you look, does this thing already exist? In this case, it's called database connection on the database, uh, on the G object. If it's returning none, it means it hasn't been created before. So we can connect to the database. And then we just return it and store it on this G object. So from that moment onwards, the first time someone needs the database, database connection will appear, usually out of a pool. In this case, it just connects like this. And then there's a separate thing called the tiered on app context function. So you can register as many of those as you want. And then whenever the context closes down, for instance, end of request or end of crunch up or something like this, it looks, is there a database connection? If there is one, it just closes it out. Um, Django obviously does this for you somewhere. Um, with Flask, you do it explicitly, or an extension of Flask does it for you. Uh, has the nice upside that you know exactly where it happens if you need to figure out where it happens. Um, but it also means that you're in control of putting more of those things in. So for instance, a very common way to do user management is you have a function called getUser. It gives you the current user. If there is a user stored on the G object, it will return it. Otherwise, it will try to load it from somewhere. So for instance, um, for tests, or for, um, for tests, you could put it, the user directly on G. Um, otherwise, you can start looking for the user in other places. For instance, there are common ways to look at the current session object or current request object and try to figure out what the current user is based on session data. And then you can load it, stuff it on there, and return it. Um, and you can do this with as many things as you want. Like for instance, very often I put uh, current language on there, current security context. I will cover this a little bit later. Um, and you know at any point in time where is it, and you can like s stuff onto this G object and can put different data. Um, for extensions, they can also use G, but they shouldn't. There's a hidden object behind the scenes where it's like where there's not a shared namespace where you can put this information. Uh, but the idea is the same. So on first usage, just stuff it on this G object. It's local to your current request, crunch up, whatever it is, and it just keep working on it. So this is how um, the basic management of resources kind of works in Flask. This is how you could build an API with it. Um, there's lots of extensions for Flask for like RESTful APIs and stuff like this. I actually don't use those. I write it myself because it turns out to be very little code that you have to write. So the common way in which I write um, an API in Flask that speaks JSON or something like this is I create an object called API result or something of that sort, which stores the return value the API wants to generate um, and status code and whatever information I want to generate from the API. Um, the reason for this is that I want my APIs my API endpoints to be consistent in regards to sort of what format they speak. They should all speak roughly the same type of JSON. They should roughly correspond to uh, have the similar behavior for headers they produce, um, for how they place white space, which variables they leave out in the responses, and so forth, uh, which MIME type they produce, and so forth. Like, they, I want this to be consistent. Um, and I want it to be specific to my API. So for instance, some APIs do pagination in link headers. Some APIs do pagination by having custom headers. 
some APIs want to return how many, uh, how many um, API requests you have left in your rate limiting window. Stuff like this. So I just moved this into one common thing called API result. And I returned this from my Flask functions. Um, now, by returning this from my Flask functions, something in Flask needs to respond to this. Uh, and you can actually do this with a very simple subclass from Flask. Uh, and you overwrite the make response method on it. This is called by Flask for all return values from view functions. In this case, I will just check, is the return value an API result? And if the return value is an API result, I convert it into a response object. Um, otherwise, I go with the default behavior. The default behavior is if it returns a string, it will make a response object with MIME type text, text set to text HTML. If it returns a tuple, it will return first part as a response, the second part as status code. Um, if it runs a response object, it keeps it as such and so forth. Like there are different um, default behaviors that it has. So I just overwrite it and add another one. Similar thing I do for exceptions. An exception has a message and a status in this case, but it could like, have many more things like common error codes, uh, HTTP response codes it wants to return, and so forth. Um, and then I have a function called toResult, which returns an API result. So it's like a similar thing. Um, now I just need to tell Flask what happens when an API exception flies out of a function. You can do this with this register error handler. It's a, what happens when an exception of a certain type is thrown, in this case, API exception, and I convert it into a result. And then it goes through the regular handling and eventually ends up in an uh, uh, API response. And then you, can, oh, then you can just do things like this. You have a blueprint. Uh, it gets two arguments out of the request object, uh, checks if they are both set, if they are not set, or if the type doesn't match. You erase an API exception. Otherwise, it returns an API result. Um, so that's really quite straightforward. It doesn't change a lot of behavior in Flask itself. And it means that the function in itself returns nice objects you can inspect in your tests. So if you call this add numbers function directly in your test, it would return objects you can do assertions on. You can make sure that it actually has the response that you want without having to go through like actually parsing the JSON back from the, from the, uh, from the test client if you want to do it this way. Um, obviously, in this particular case here, we have the request arguments. It's actually incorrect. It should say request args.get. Um, but it, it pulls out these arguments manually, um, and, and that's not very nice. So how do you validate? How do you do this serialization? Um, to be absolutely honest, for the most part, I hate this a lot in Python. There are so many different ways to validate things, and almost all of them are falling into very weird cases. Um, the, like, I think whenever people are bored, they write a new validation and type conversion framework. Um, they are either very powerful and super opinionated, and, um, and, and they are fun, but then they are very restrictive in other ways. So you need to generate a response in a slightly different format, and all of a sudden it falls over. Or you, you can't have the date format you want, or just changing the date format is too much work. Uh, or they're really powerful, and they're so painful to use that nobody wants to do it. Um, or they're super weak, and then they decide on how your API has to look like, and you can't live with the limitations. So finding the right library is really hard to do this. Um, there are lots of people who do JSON schema now. Um, uh, that is just a lot. Um, one that I like to use is Voluptus, or whatever you call it. Um, it's a very quite straightforward thing if you want to use it with Flask. Uh, you can make a decorator, which takes a schema object. Um, then it actually returns a decorator like this standard kebab. But what it does is when the function, the view function, gets called, it gets the JSON data from the request. It runs it through the schema. And it updates the keyword arguments to the function with the return value of the schema. And then if an error happens, I convert it into an API exception. It can make this much nicer that it returns like, more structured information. Um, and then otherwise, it just called the original function like it was. So to go back to the add numbers example, so you can, for instance, run add data schema. And then you pass in a schema from this library. Um, and you set like A and B have to be integers, and then extra arguments you want to remove. And now it goes through data validation, which takes your schema data. It goes to the Flask request, um, passes it through the schema, and then eventually 
invokes the function with those two things, and you can do your result. Um, this is a general rule. is kind of how I like doing this. Um, not always with the same library. Sometimes people already have some stuff. But this idea of attaching it to, uh, to basically the, to the function is conceptually something that I like. Um, often I make it a little bit more complicated so that testing becomes easier. Um, so I already mentioned I don't actually use ex extensions for this. I think they are really nice for a lot of things like, for instance, database connections. Uh, like I like Flask for alchemy and stuff like this. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Flask RESTful, or is it called Rest, Flask RESTful? Uh, because they're super opinionated in regards to how the response format should be. And I, I generally tend to run into some form of limitation in there or stuff I don't like. And then actually changing your behavior turns out to be a massive pain. So actually hand rolling this uh, worked well for me in the past at least. Uh, in particular, error handling is so much nicer if you can do it yourself. I like to return errors in a really nice format so that whoever writes the client for it has only a few conditions to, to handle. In particular, when you talk about mobile APIs that need to handle errors uh, or retry logic and stuff like this, the clearer the errors are and the better documented uh, and the fewer spurious errors that come from internal APIs go out, uh, the, the the closer it gets to an API that everybody understands. I mean, there will always be this case where the client author gets error codes from the API, which are not always clear where, where they come from, like uh, system overloaded, Nginx misconfigured, that kind of stuff. So you need to deal with them anyways. But the majority of API errors will be for conforming to your specific error format that you can do something with them. Um, and also, the moment you control this this API generation internally, this API response generation internally, you can add more stuff to it. So for instance, if you, uh, if you take this API result object we had before, very often APIs want to generate like an information where is the next item in my pagination. So in this case, I just have next page as the URL to the next page. And then when it is set, then I add the link header with the correct format. Like it doesn't change fundamentally. I don't have to go into some weird framework someone else made and look how to extend this framework for custom headers to be consistently handled. I just add it to my handy API response object and, and off it goes. And this is the part where I like this the most. Uh, is it makes security so much easier. Uh, the, if, you, if you know how the context in Flask works and if you control a lot of this tooling that goes around it, and in particular also where your user data comes from, you can build secure systems without having to rely a lot of, on developers doing this themselves. Um, the better the abstractions are, the easier it is to make security-related APIs that are actually secure. Um, the way I do this is I make the code aware of the context executed at. What this means is that imagine you're signing in. Uh, imagine you have an application where there are many different customers, and each customer sees is supposed to only see customer-related information. The worst that can happen in that case is if you forget to limit the data to just that customer. And trust me, that many people had found some situations where an API response would return data that is not, res not supposed to be for that user. So very often, you also have the situation where a user can be a member of multiple organizations. So the API call takes the organization ID to say, like, I want the data for this particular organization. And then whoever writes that API endpoint doesn't actually verify that the user is a member of that organization. So that happens way too often. Um, the nice thing is once you have a security context, you can actually automatically limit all your queries like this. So for instance, in all new code I write, there is a security object or a security module where there's, for instance, a function get available organizations. And then the basic query object on the project Make sure that you will only ever get projects where the organization is in the list of valid organizations. So even if someone makes a really shitty query, he will not be able to remove that filter. Like, you would have to completely throw away the query object. So it, that entire security problem goes away for as long as this get available organizations returns the correct thing. And it's just an example of, uh, of, of how to shoot a lot of security problems in one go. Uh, because you have this information, what is my current security context? And as a result, you can make clever decisions. Um, this context-specific context, really, this context security also comes up in other situations. A lot of, uh, a couple of years ago, a lot of PHP code used to just print out strings randomly 
and then uh, cross-site scripting became a thing because people discovered they can inject HTML into those things. Um, that keeps happening over and over. Like people used to just print out strings that are like, I don't know, for instance, a, a, a message into something where certain characters change the behavior of it. Like be it uh, strings going into HTML, strings going into JSON, JSON, strings going into JSON, that's JSON going into HTML and so forth. Um, the, 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 the incorrect way to fix this would be to just try to strip HTML code out of strings. Um, that's something that keeps happening. Uh, in particular, in the PHP world, people still like to remove sanitized content, which means remove some things out of it because they're too scared uh, about passing this potentially dangerous or hazardous string to different APIs. Um, but if you actually consider it, the only thing you need to know is the context in which the string came from and where the context is, where the string is being used. So for instance, if you have used Flask, the templating in Flask, if you pass a string to the template, it, it knows the context of the template is HTML, so it will automatically escape it. Unless you pass a string which was explicitly marked as being valid for HTML. Um, we, we also extended the same thing for JSON. So if you have any JSON string, it doesn't matter if it contains HTML or not. Flask is clever enough to actually serialize it out in a format which is as safe as possible in, in all the contexts you can imagine it. Uh, so you can put it into script tags, you can put it into HTML. It doesn't contain any characters in any format that would be dan dangerous for the context you put it at. Um, this is something I think that should be considered more. Like, in which context are you using this? Uh, I know that we had a situation where Sentry had a bunch of very specific JSON serialization functions, and it was very easy to misuse them. So we had a JSON serialization function that would serialize JSON specifically for the use in HTML attributes. We had one that was specifically for in HTML blobs. It was one specifically for uh, script tags. There was one that was specifically for, um, for writing into none of those things, just into normal strings. And if a developer used the wrong one and then a sufficiently, uh, I don't know, bad person was taking advantage of this, you could like inject script again. Um, so the, the idea here is like simplify the API, obviously. So there is only one function in Flask, which is automatically the right one which appears within templates. If you use the two JSON filter in templates, um, it will always do the right thing. Um, but it applies, obviously, to custom code as well. Um, just make sure that you have an understanding of what the data looks like and then which context it will be used. And make sure that there is an automatic system in place to convert it from this one thing into this other thing. Last part is testing. How do you test Flask applications? Uh, there are many different ideas of how to do it. My favorite one is PyTest. Um, the nice thing about PyTest is the fixture support. Um, what fixtures can do is basically they run very common code that you have as part of your test before and after, and they will manage this for you. So you just write a test function, and you just say, I want to use this fixture and this fixture, and then it happens automatically. So a uh, basic example, which you would find in many places, would be you make a PyTest fixture that goes to a file called conftest.py. You make this PyTest fixture, you set the scope to module, which means that the entire module that your tests are in are going to call this thing only once. And then you just import your application, you create it with the right configuration for tests, you create this app context, you push it, and then you tell PyTest that when it's done executing all of this, and should pop the context. And then it just returns the application. So that's the most straightforward fixture you can have. So any test now, which accepts a, um, an argument by the name of app, will automatically get the return value of this. Um, you can also see that this function here, app, takes an argument called request. Um, this means that this is also a fixture that's being executed. So this fixture depends on another fixture called request. This is like dependency injection. Um, so if you write a test now, it takes an argument called app. It will run this behind the scenes. It will cache the return value for the duration of the module. And then you can do assertions on it, like assert that the name of the app is your package. You can make this more interesting. You can, this is missing the fixture part, but this would be a fixture. It should be called, yeah. So this should also be a fixture, um, but it takes the request 
fixture and it takes the app. Then it makes a test client, it enters the test client, and then when the test finalizes, it makes sure that the client is closed and returns the client. And then with that, you can make much more interesting tests, like you make the test client get the slash welcome page, make sure that there is no set cookie in the headers, for instance, if that's what you want to test. It makes sure that the string welcome appears in the return values data, uh, and it makes sure that the status code is 200, stuff like this. So PyTest for me, I used to dislike it for a lot of the magic that it did. Um, they cleaned up a lot of this. Um, it's actually really good now. In particular, the asserts that you see here, behind the scenes, they get rewritten. So this assert statement actually becomes, um, and we do like assert blah, blah, blah equals blah, blah, blah. Behind the scenes, it has a transformation step. We'll convert the left part of the statement and the right part into individual function calls. Um, so it will actually do a, like you have in unit test, there will be an assert equal rv.status and 200. Um, conceptually, it actually does something different. But the idea is it understands that this is a comparison. So if this comparison fails, it will not just tell you assertion failed. It will tell you what the left side is and what the right side is. So we'll print this out and also uh, give you all kinds of other introspectability. One of the things, for instance, it localizes your print statements. So if you print in this function anywhere before the failing assert, it will tell you, like, these are all the things I printed so far um, and as part of this test. So it, it makes debugging much, much easier. Last part to cover is basically how do you web sockets and stuff like this with Flask? And the answer for the most part is you don't really. Um, there is no amazing answer to this question. And the reason it had nothing to do with Flask in itself as it has to do with scaling. Um, what you don't want to do is you don't want to say, oh, this is Flask, we're going to add WebSockets to it now, and then, there you go, do WebSockets with it. Um, because from a fundamental scaling point of view, scaling a Flask application is, uh, it, there's a request coming in, there's a response going out, there's some time spent in this, and while that Flask request handler is doing this stuff, nothing else really does anything. Um, there might be multiple threads handling this, there might be greenlets handling this, there might be a lot of stuff happening, but you could take, I expect these number of requests coming in a certain time window. I will, take, I will need these many processes to handle this. Um, and you can get an idea of how long it will take to execute. And as such, you can figure out how many CPUs do you need, how many workers do you need, like how many uh, individual machines do you need. Um, but with WebSockets, none of that makes any sense. Because for instance, you can have a, uh, you take an application which has, um, opens a WebSocket connection for every tab that you're in. And then because uh, the tab is open, the WebSocket connection stays open for the duration of the tab. And the whole point of that WebSocket connection would be to give you updates about comments that come in, like GitHub does this. If you're on a GitHub issue page, you can keep it open, and GitHub will stream in more comments coming in. Um, you could have thousands and thousands of tabs open, and these requests do nothing other than taking up uh, file descriptor on the server and a little bit of context information, and, and the socket, obviously. Um, but it's very hard to predict what's going to happen. It, worse than that, you're shipping out the code update, now the WebSocket connection drops. So if you have like a million WebSocket connections open, ship out the code update, and the Flask server tears down all WebSocket connections, and then all the browsers reconnect, and you're going to take yourself down because you have like this massive wave of reconnects coming in. So scaling a WebSocket setup is very different than scaling a Flask application. So moving this stuff into Flask is just going to open up more questions. In particular, if you have a million WebSocket connections, and all of them can do a database connection. Do you have then a million database connections to your Postgres server? That sounds like a terrible idea. Um, so obviously, there are solutions for this problem. Um, but it's, it's a very complex problem. And it, it requires a bit of a thinking process. Um, so if you actually think about how you want to use WebSocket, it turns out you don't need Flask for this. Um, this is what I do. Um, this is what many people do. Uh, this is one example of what you can do. It's not the only one. But you can make a Redis server, you use it as a broker, and use PubSub to, on the one hand, publish events from Flask into this WebSocket broker. And the WebSocket broker has a front end sitting to it. It's a custom little server that subscribes to the PubSub channels and forwards this information into WebSockets. That turns out to be like 300 lines of code uh, at, as a straightforward base ex estimation. You can build this with Tornado. You can build this with Node.js if you feel like it. You can build this with Go. You can build it with almost anything. Um, and all you do from your Flask application is you push these events into these individual subscription channels. 
and then the browser connects to this WebSocket server independently of it connecting to the Flask server. And then you just get these updates sent out. Um, if you actually look at GitHub, I'm, I, I don't know how they build it, but all your WebSocket connections that you have with GitHub, and they don't actually use WebSockets. I think they use server sent events, which is uh, it's like the WebSocket without the up part. You only get an incoming stream of events to the browser. They actually connect it on a completely different host than the rest of GitHub. So I'm assuming they also have a completely different server doing this kind of stuff. And it makes a lot of sense to have a different server for this, because I like to deploy often. I like to deploy uh, multiple times an hour, if possible. Whenever I do a deploy and I would destroy all WebSocket connections, that would like, make me unhappy. Because it means that every time I ship an update, users will lose their connectivity and they will have to needlessly reconnect. This server, which sends events from Redis into the browser, that needs an update maybe once a month. So you can keep it running while you deploy your code. All that changes is that the server um, that is currently down to do a code deploy and then comes up with a new version, it needs to reconnect to Redis. But it doesn't change fundamentally anything about the events that go to the, to the user. Um, so now you have two independent systems. They probably need to do some form of authentication between each other. Easy way to do that is you give both of those systems, your Flask backend and your WebSocket server, if you call it that way, uh, a shared secret key. Then they can use uh, code signing to exchange authentication information. Um, that's the easiest way to make sure that users can only subscribe to channels which they're entitled to. So the server t says, like, you now need to subscribe to the super private channel. The, it gives the front end code a little signed message. The front end code goes with that signed message to the WebSocket server and says, please subscribe me to this. And the WebSocket server makes sure that the signature is correct and then subscribes the user. That's one way to do it. Um, I'm kind of disappointed that there is no open source project which actually does that. I'm sort of hoping that someone will do this out of the Django Channels project. Um, there's, there's the attempt to make a standardized specification for Django Channels called ASGI. ASGI could be used in a way to simplify the building of this. So Django Channels are actually also only using Redis as a broker. That's all it does. OK, and with that, I'm kind of at the end of this random collection of thoughts. Um, and I would love to answer questions to this, in particular also not necessarily related to, to Flask, but just open source development. Use, use this micro, is this on? Is this on? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, use this microphone. Can more. you put this a little bit lower? Because it's so high that, yeah. How do I do that? Do I, uh, this? You can just hold it, right? Yeah. yeah. Boom. Hi, Armin. Should we oh, clap okay. for you first? Like, we should clap, right? He did a good job. Uh, my question is, so you uh, Flask and Verkzoig, did I say that right? Yeah. Cool. Uh, were, you wrote those a while ago, uh, the first time. And so looking back in all of your, um, you know, we, we all grow as engineers as we, we keep doing this stuff. What do you regret most about a design decision in Flask that like you wish you could change, but it's just like way too late? Ah, uh, yeah, that way too many of those. Um, <laughs> Top three. So the, the biggest issue is like as you go back into the base libraries of it, code gets older. So Flask, in comparison, is recent. Um, Werkzeug is sort of the older version of it because it's the base library that run, drives the whiskey dr system, and Werkzeug made some really terrible decisions at the time. So in particular, Werkzeug sticks to the standard of WSGI way more than the rest of the Python ecosystem did, um, which means that it has a lot of overhead in it to support some potentially to the standard sticking implementation, which doesn't actually exist in the world anymore. Um, so particular input streams, in, uh, as they're handled in Werkzeug, they assume risky servers which no longer exist. Um, and that has unfortunately left its mark in the code. Um, there, there are a bunch of more, more of those things. Um, so that I regret for the most, the most is that it sticked so much to the standard more than other people did. I wouldn't do that again. I am happy to break some standards in the future because the collective ignoring of standards is actually what drives us forward to fixing them. Um, 
So that is, that is a massive pain now, uh, that there is this kind of stuff in there. Um, I, I'm trying not to do that mistake anymore. Flask itself, I think, has a, um, Chincha has more warts, uh, even as a template engine. Uh, I didn't know how to write parsers at the time, so the way I wrote the parser ranks mathematical operators at different priorities. So for instance, multiplication has a higher priority than division, which makes absolutely no sense. Um, but I feel like if I fix it now, I will break someone's template. So that's the kind of stuff where like, I'm actually quite OK with it being broken, because you can use parentheses to, to like, fix the case up. Um, but there's just a lot of stuff like this in there. The Chincher compiler also is not the nicest thing in the world, and it has lots of bugs I know about. But I'm just too afraid of breaking people's stuff. And, and when it comes to the Flask framework, I think there's a lot of functionality in there which I would no longer put in there, like signed cookies, for instance. I'm not sure if it's a good idea to have it as a default. Um, likewise, I think it should always had it should always have had an answer for how to import modules. So I gave another presentation a couple of months ago, uh, a couple of weeks ago actually, um, about Python's import system. That was a part of it, and the Python's import system is actually not particularly nice, and it has really weird effects. Um, and I, I came to the conclusion that the only sensible solution in Python is to import everything at the start of it. Um, and because then afterwards, local imports, which people do in functions, will continue functioning. There has never been a good support in Flask to make sure that we import the entirety of your project. Um, but now it kind of feels too late to do that. And also, this it took me a long time to make the shell executable for Flask. I was too proud to, put, to make it. Um, that annoyed me now. Uh, and so a couple of months ago, we, uh, it might even be longer than that now. Sometime last year, I think, we started working on making this shell executable, which is so much better now. I, mean, I actually enjoy this now, because I no longer hit connection reset. That's the biggest feature. Hi, so I have a two-part question. Is there any truth to the rumor that you actually started Flask as a joke? A practical joke, and can you give us some color on that? And second, what does the name, where does the name come from? Thank you. So uh, the answer is yes, it was a practical joke. There was, um, uh, so there was a framework. So I'm not going to name any names here, because uh, the problem is when you, like I, I, I wrote this vector library, and I was very happy with sticking to the standards and covering all the edge cases and everything that I knew about. And a lot of engineering went into this thing. And along came other developers who used the CGI module in the standard library to write web frameworks on it. And I found this very wrong. I knew about all the cases where it's wrong, and I had arguments on the mailing list. Like, why do you not use like, an implementation like Vectoic to do this? And at that point, the argumentation was that, well, then I have to have a dependency. And that was, like, we all know the Python packaging ecosystem is not particularly nice, but it was already not the worst thing in the world to have one dependency. In particular, a dependency was explicitly written so that you can vendor it if you have to. Um, so there were two frameworks that sort of re-implemented everything. Um, and as a joke, I made an April Fool's screencast where I had a friend of mine who is Dutch make a fake French developer impression of him writing this framework called Deny It, which was an early version of Flask which had the dependencies uh, zipped and base64 encoded into the last line of the framework. Um, so when you imported it, it actually dumped this out in a in temporary file and imported it from there. Um, so that was a joke. And, um, but then the thing is, the joke became so popular. And surprisingly enough, it didn't become popular because it was a joke. It became popular just because um, like it, was, uh, it was a micro framework. And I discovered that people actually liked this idea of having this small little thing. And I was like, OK, so since micro frameworks are actually something people do, maybe I can make one that actually does this best practice on uses, reuses dependencies. That's how that happened. And the name Flask is a pun on another framework that came just out at that time, which also is a vessel containing fluids. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that's where that comes from. And the logo is, uh, is not appropriate, because it's not a flask, it's a horn. And everybody says it's a chili pepper. <laughs> I have a question about the WebSockets architecture that you described. Mm -hmm. 
So I see some uh, disadvantages in that architecture. First of all, it still requires HTTP from the web, from the browser to the server, and you have to do HTTP handshake every time, and you're not using the fact that WebSockets is uh, two-way connection, and also it makes the architecture way more complicated. You have, you need to have Redis or some other QMQP or whatever implementation, and makes the whole system way more fragile this way. Well, so, so the question is, why not use something like I think that I ought to have the first class support of WebSockets in Well, first. because like it's only complicated for the Hello World case. And the Hello World case is really not the case I care about. Because the moment it's more than Hello World, you're, it doesn't help you if it runs out of the same process. In particular, it's going to have all the downsides that I mentioned, like code updates tearing down your connection and so forth. Um, so th that's, that's one thing. Like, it's very easy to make a I wouldn't call it populistic, but it's kind of like this, 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 it's not hard to make a, uh, like a really simple, straightforward, oh, there's your WebSocket in your same application. And, and that's not new. Like, people have been doing this for a long time, even before AsyncIO came out. Um, and there were lots of people that wrote like, little games with WebSocket connection and so forth in the beginning. Where it's like, oh, it's like, I have just this one executable and it handles like 10,000 connections. But what if you have a million connections? All the fun, you have to start thinking about this again. So I don't actually think that Redis as a, dependency is going to make it harder. If anything, Redis as a dependency makes it actually much easier because Redis is surprisingly good to introspect. Um, so uh, the nice thing about Redis that I discovered uh, many years ago, but I, I keep using, is the fact that I can actually look at what the damn thing is doing. Um, so I can see the traffic is going through my connections and so forth. Um, Async.io is just a concurrency library. Like You can write it this particular thing in Async.io. Um, I, I will never merge anything into Flask. I would never write an extension that would move the WebSocket hub into the same process that runs my WebSocket application. That I, I fundamentally believe that that's, uh, sorry, that runs the Flask application. I fundamentally believe that that's, it sends the wrong message to people. It sends the message that this is a viable deployment, which I don't believe it is. Um, about the overhead of the TCP connection, uh, so the thing is WebSockets at the moment are actually kind of, I wouldn't call it dead, but they're, they're dying a very weird slow death because there is HTTP2 now, which doesn't support WebSockets, um, which multiplexes multiple connections over one HTTP2 connection, which solves this problem implicitly because um, you're using SSE streaming on the way out, right. which goes over one of many uh, like these multiplex connections, but you only have one connection going to the server, which is actually so much better because before that, each and every tab you opened, if you actually used um, WebSockets, they all had individual WebSockets connections. Um, so HTTP2 is solving that. And I really don't care about the optimized case of sending messages into the server because for things I write, that doesn't come up that often. Like It's usually user interactions that send a message to the server. Like Unless you do analytics or something like this, you don't have a constant stream from the browser to the server. If anything, you want to avoid this. Um, WebSockets don't avoid this at all because WebSockets actually have uh, keep alive from both sides. So both the server and the client keep the connection alive. Um, with SSE, very often people just keep the connection open for five minutes and then reconnect um, because you only have to keep alive from one side. Um, and with HTTP2, that, all of that logic now moves into a completely separate layer where the browser is responsible for keeping the HTTP2 connection alive and then you no longer care about what the SSE stream does because you know it's living in this nice little mm -hmm wrapped up HTTP2 part. So okay. I, I, for that reason, Thank I think you. this is actually going to be the solution for this problem. I'm convinced already. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Hi, my uh, question is actually not about Python. I know you are recently into the Rust programming language for all those like, uh, goodies, like hybrid, you know, more functional, pattern matching, memory safe, those kind of thing. So if you want to do some framework like, you know, in, uh, like a Flask in Rust, say what would it you know, look like? Um, so I, I don't have any plans of making a framework for Flask, but there is already a thing called Pencil, which looks exactly like Flask, <laughs> um, which is written by someone who was a Python programmer and is now doing Rust as a, like a practical exercise. Um, the thing is Rust is, I think it's what Python was 10 years ago, as, uh, as when it comes to the ecosystem. So the ecosystem in Python at that point was um, it had a lot of missing functionality. And I think it still has uh, this in some regards. Like Python, for instance, has a really bad answer to packaging. Um, Rust already has it in some areas. Like Cargo is a really good system there. 
but it, it lacks so many other things to make a framework on it. And it doesn't just lack the things to make a framework on it, it also lacks the understanding in the Rust community of what a framework would look like. But I, I totally believe that in like a couple of years, it will be a very good base layer to build microservices because it has such a strong um, support for building really good abstractions. Um, there, there's a lot of stuff that I wish I could do in Python because I know fundamentally it's the right way to do it. Like schema validation, for instance, in Python, actually, like, there would be a right way to do it, I believe, but you can't do it because it's too slow. Um, likewise, this Django channels thing where you have like individual components talking to each other over like a, a Redis broker or something like this has an enormous serialization overhead in Python. And then people build things like Captain Proto and, 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 and Thrift and, and, and God knows what. And they are actually, they, they don't feel like the right tool for what you do in Python. Like they feel like this enormous complexity some people don't want to be involved with. I think in Rust, with how the language is structured, especially with compiler plugins and so forth, that could be really interesting. Uh, it's just not there yet. So maybe in, in five years. Okay. Thank you so much. I think we're done, that's my guess.